without further ado, I think we can have Mike Jones, our first Lightning Talk speaker. And I'll just hand the mic over to Mike. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, Lightning Talks. How long is this Lightning Talk? Okay. He, he said, you said three, he said five, and somebody else said as long as you want. So we'll see. You can start booing when I'm... Okay, last year at PyCon in Cape Town, I gave a talk called Idea to Launch in Days, um, and that was so 2013. So this year I'm going to talk about launch to a borderline zombie in a year. And that, this is the story of what happened after the talk last year. So um, we proposed this... Um, the last time we were going to talk about what it takes to launch and run and continually improve a service, and we looked at the ideas, build, service, measure, data, learn, and we focused over here. But actually, um, then we launched... Uh, at the time, it was called On The Way Coffee Subscription Service or something long and meaningless. And then we closed On The Way Down because it wasn't working and wasn't making any money. But people liked this. So it was surprising. And um, this happened. This bit was fun. This bit needs more and more effort. And this bit is fun. So we keep coming back to this bit and not doing more of this bit on the bit, which is like measuring and learning and, and getting lots of new customers, and we just keep coming back and, and doing stuff. So I said, we should stop starting over, stop reinventing, stop being distracted. Um, so we rebranded, and we rebuilt it, and we reinvented it, and then we got busy doing consulting. Um, so kind of didn't really listen to any of my own advice, um, but it looks pretty, doesn't it? It looks much better. Which one do you prefer? That one? Or that one? That one. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, oops, we rebranded and relaunched. Um, we decided to rebuild an entire subscription management system from scratch um, using the code base we already had, which was kind of inventing, but it was reinventing. Um, we can call it a pivot, and then it's cool. Um, and then we got very distracted because our bank balance declined again, and we had to make some money. So, um, unfortunately, like, this was our hopes and dreams, <laughs> and this was the crushing reality. And so, um, the, this, is, this is the challenge. Um, the, the, the reality check is that we actually need about 1,500 customers in order for me to full-time work on this, which... It's quite a lot of people drinking a lot of coffee. And uh, raise your hand if you're a customer of One Less Thing in here. Yeah, hello, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, this is what's amazing. The Python, PyCon ZA customers have been the most loyal because you're obviously in desperate need of caffeination. Um, and, but however, with some kind of network effect, maybe from this year's conference, we can make it so that it goes from me and my four hungry kids and George um, looking very sad, and you and one free month of one less thing, and maybe we can make it so that we do a happy dance. So if you sign up this week on onelessthing.co.za, I will give you your first month of coffee caffeination to the brain for free, and... Um, and you will love it, and you won't have to pay. Just put in the further details about um, where it says delivery details extra. Just put PyCon ZA, Mike wore a scale comp t-shirt, something like that. Something so we've got a secret like code. Okay, somebody puts that on the internet, I will hunt you down, because um, I can use grep on my logs. <laughs> it's it's good. Thank you very much. Cool. Next up is Richard Larkin, who is going to be speaking a bit about why you should be using Kiwi 
while Richard's setting up, I thought I should maybe say something about one less thing. There, I'm a very happy customer. <laughs> there was a month this year where Mike's billing system forgot to bill people. And when they discovered it, Mike, I think, won a lot of customer loyalty by just not billing people for that month. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the kind of service that you can look forward to. All right, the coffee boxes also come with something, a little extra surprise every month, um, which is useful if you have people in your household who don't drink coffee but who like surprises. <laughs> oh, are we almost good to go? Yes. Have a microphone. Hi there. Yeah, I'm Richard, and my talk is in tour titled that if you are doing, doing a GUI in Python and you are not using Kiwi, you are dumb. It's the only way to say it, but actually, to be reality, it's just probably because you're ignorant of Kiwi or haven't heard of it, because there is almost no sane reason not to be using Kiwi if you're doing a GUI. I mean, let's think of the options we have. We have TK Inter, Ancient and Ugly. We have Qt, WX, GTK. All these are aging frameworks, don't support multi-touch, run only on desktop, terribly unexciting. So why would you want to use them? The truth is you should be using Kiwi because Kiwi is awesome. I have it here on paper, it must be true. So why is it awesome? First of all, it runs on Windows, Linux, Mac, iOS, and Android. It's about the only thing you can use that you can run on all those platforms. Same code base. Not only that, but it's OpenGL accelerated using OpenGL ES2, so it's fast. Plus, it requires not a very powerful device. Most of your phones, as long as you aren't running Symbian, will be able to run OpenGL ES2. So, yes. Plus, Kivi is a full, full stack framework. It doesn't only give you a GUI toolkit, it gives you a whole lot of cross platform tools that you can do a whole lot of really nice stuff with. Um, it's open source license. MIT um, on GitHub, and it is really nice, fast, responsive, and fluid. It's a great way to do novel user interfaces, things that are exciting. I mean, let's face it, GTK, GTK into these things are old. They don't, they don't work on mobile, and they don't feel ex exciting or fluid. So we need to move on. This is the 2000s. So what I'm going to do here is just to take away so that you don't have to look at my ugly face anymore. We're going to look at a video. This just will give you an idea of what Kivi is capable of. I'm trying to get. Is it playing? Yes. Now this is an app. It's just one of the apps written in. Um, is that playing? Yes. Just one of the apps written in Kivi. There's plenty on the gallery. I'd really suggest you go and have a look because Kivi gives you real freedom. The nice thing is because it's an OpenGL, it doesn't depend on your OS widgets on anything on the OS, really. All it needs is OpenGL, and you get a totally native and consistent interface across different platforms. So look at that. Swipe is built in. Kivi comes with a GUI toolkit that knows and understands multi-touch from the beginning. It's a full multi-touch framework. So you don't have to code that. You just drop widgets into a container widgets, which Kivi is great at, and it works. It's scrollable. It's fluid. See there, he's switching on. And this is an app that connects to an audio mixer. So you can't hear this, but what he's doing is switching on tracks. Um, you'll see there, switching on MIDI, enabling it. There's a pop-up that he's now selecting various MIDI sources, selects that. Um, and this is all, um, for example, there. That is effortless to do in Kivi. Kivi comes with a complete set of widget toolkits that do this kind of thing for you. Accordions, scroll layouts, sliders, buttons, um, rotating widgets. It's, it's really easy to do. Almost all of this is using Kivi standard widgets. And to do that scrolling, that you actually don't need to do any code. All you're doing is popping one container inside of another, giving it layout hints, and it takes care of the rest for you. Kivi has also been doing multi-touch for a long time on very different resolutions. So almost all of the stuff uses layouts. You don't do hard-coded um, pixel placements. You use layouts, and it scales fluidly to different resolution screen devices. So it takes a lot of that hassle of designing for different devices away from you. Um, yeah, he's he switching things on and off. You should really go and look at this with audio. It's much more exciting. There's another one where a guy's done basically a whole 
instrument panel on a wall where he does his, um, yes. As I said, it's, it's designed for multi-touch from the ground up, but your only limitation there is your, your input device, your screen, how many fingers you can put on it are not limited by Kivi. Um, but you'll see here we get some animation. You see the top left, those things are showing that button is now doubling as a progress device. You have your little meters popping up at here. You have almost no limitations graphically for Kivi. It's what you do, and this will probably run on your phone if it can connect to this mixer. So that gives you the kind of idea. There's, a, for example, a keyboard embedded in a tab panel. Um, you just pop it in, no worries, that's a keyboard. Change tabs, boom, now we have a, a drum pad. Um, and remember, all of this is talking through a remote protocol to an actual and a different audio program. Um, so yeah, this is just another interface for it. Here, these are custom widgets he's done, sliding, changing volumes, panning. Um, I'm do not actually exactly sure what those do, but you can go and look at the video and check for yourself. Um, the main thing is, here he's got beautiful cool dots that he can move around. <laughs> Gotta love that. So the main thing is you can see that this and this, to tell you the truth, is recorded in 2012. So this is not new for Kivi. This is old hat. Um, but that looks much sexier than I've ever seen TK Inter look. So I'm going to end it there because I've basically had my rant. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Can I ask questions? So that is one of the rules of lightning talks is that questions wait until the end. <laughs> um, as in, once the speaker is outside. <laughs> um, next up is Adam. Well, yeah, um, start getting set up. So this is n not directly related to Kiwi, but you could use Kiwi. So how many of you know what PyWeek is? Okay, a lot of you don't know what PyWeek is. So PyWeek is a bi-yearly uh, competition, is maybe not the right word, event, where people around the world writes, commit to writing a game in Python in a week. And then everyone who submits a game gets to judge and rate other people's games. It's a lot of fun. A bunch of us in Cape Town have participated quite a few times. The next PyWeek is starting this Sunday. So if you're at the sprints and looking for something to do and feel like writing a game, you can enter PyWeek. Um, and you can write your game in Kiwi and have it run on people's phones if you like. Oh, and it looks like Adam is good to go. Cool. Um, quick show of hands. Uh, who of you here knows what PyPy is? Oh, awesome, lots of you. OK, so um, the last two. PyCons, we were very much blessed. We had guys from the actual PyPy dev team down. They gave exceptionally awesome talks on PyPy. Um, they were, like, if you haven't watched them on the, uh, you know, the, the recorded videos and stuff, you really should go and, and dig into them. They're awesome. So I'm just going to, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of PyPy, so I'm just going to give a quick, you know, like, you know, why you should use PyPy kind of talk. So, I mean, obviously, um, as you know, PyPy is actually kind of two things. On one hand, it's, you know, just a jitting Python interpreter, which is actually written using the other part of PyPy, which is kind of a framework for writing interpreters using a reduced version of Python. So, you probably know there's a couple of other interesting um, projects using the R Python. There's Topaz, which is a Ruby implementation. Uh, I think that's slightly stalled a little bit, but, you know, hopefully they'll pick up some speed again. And then obviously there's uh, Hippie VM, which is uh, one of the actually one of the guys who's like one of the main devs on PyPy is working on that, and it's a PHP implementation using the the PyPy tool, toolkit. Currently, they their boast is that they're already faster than than Facebook's god awful mutant C++ PHP cross compiling nightmare. And, you know, that's using Python technology. So, I mean, that tells you a lot. Um, yeah, so, I mean, why should you use PyPy? Well, it's faster, six times faster on average. Obviously, that varies between, you know, different, you know, uses. Um, some use cases, obviously, not quite as fast. Other use cases, it is definitely faster, um, especially, like, you know, data processing. Obviously, you know, there's, you know, sometimes, you know, your data processing, you want to use something really fast. 
so you're not going to use Python at all, but sometimes you just want to write some code quickly and you want it to be faster than C Python, PyPy will help you there. Um, it's also very compliant, you know, it's Python as you know it, then very few differences. Um, you know, you're not, you're highly unlikely to run into anything which is going to make you go, what's going on? Uh, it's also very compatible. At this point, a lot of C, like C API extensions work out of box. There's a lot of cool work that's been done in terms of using CFFI rather than the C Python API to get that, you know, to, the, to where it is. There's obviously still more work to go on in that regard. And memory usage is, I mean, they've, they've got a proper garbage collector, so you can say goodbye to the ref counting from C Python, which as we all know, ref counting is so, like, you know, last few decades. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're steaming ahead on STM and the gill, and getting, well, getting rid of the gill, essentially. So that's something that they're, like, you know, actively working on. And STM is a really cool thing. Obviously, people who who've worked in a couple of other languages, Scala and so forth, have probably encountered STM implementations, like very, very interesting area. Yeah, and then otherwise, I mean, how can you help? I would say use PyPy. I mean, I, I dev on PyPy every day in terms of the projects I work on. I use PyPy, I try and make sure that, you know, my code works on PyPy. Most it's easy to do, you know, most stuff is pure Python, it just works. You encounter stuff which isn't pure Python, well, Either it, you know, it works, it's a compatible C extension, or it doesn't work, and then you go to someone's issue tracker and you file a bug saying, make it work on PyPy. And yeah, and then otherwise, you know, the only other main thing I would say is, you know, like, if you have some spare money, donate to the PyPy sprints. They, they obviously, you know, they're not a big, like, company funded by, you know, profits from somewhere. They're just like a, a non-profit organization. So they rely on funding from people, organizations, whoever can, you know, spare some cash. So if you want to see PyPy become the dominant Py, like Python uh, interpreter implementation, definitely spare a little bit of cash for PyPy because, you know, they're going places. And personally, I don't know about you, but I think that that's, that's the future of Python in terms of implementation. Um, I mean, they're supporting Python 2, Python 3. They're providing us with a modern version of the Python interpreter. There's really no reason not to go with PyPy. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Cool. Thank you very much. Cool. Next up, we have Simon. He's very bravely going to give a sort of Ruby talk, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, luckily, he has the a large podium between him and the audience. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'm not sure if you know, but Mache, one of the core PyPy developers, is usually resident in Cape Town. Um, currently, he's back in his native Poland. So there are kind of core PyPy people around, and occasionally PyPy sprints do happen in Cape Town. The one of the really cool things which has happened over the last year is that Armin Rigo wrote a new garbage collector for PyPy. And getting back again to writing games in Python, this garbage one of the reasons this new garbage collector is important is that it's incremental, so it can make guarantees about how long your process will pause for, um, which can be important for games. You don't want to necessarily have your game suddenly freeze for half a second while the garbage collector runs around and freeze, um, say, half a gig of RAM. Yeah, um, it looks like Simon is close to ready. Yes? Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Okay, let me see if the sound is actually working. Okay. All right, um, before I start, um, yes, this is Ruby. We are at a Python conference. I know. Don't kill me. I don't care so much about, well, I care more about the joy of programming than I do about Python. So um, this is a program called SonicPy. 
it's a program designed specifically for the Raspberry Pi to get kids to see the computer more as a musical instrument than actually a, compu a computational thing and to get the com computer more into things like music lessons in, in, in middle schools and stuff like that. So it's, a, it's an open source project funded by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. There's a Mac client, Windows, and Linux client, but it's designed for the, the Raspberry Pi. Um, what you see here is Ruby code. It's, it's really simple. Um, let's... So the speakers are shit, but you can hear what it's doing, right? Basically, play C, sleep for a second, play D, sleep for a second, right? So these are very simple commands. So it's specifically geared towards kids to actually start composing their own music. Now this can get really interesting really quickly because essentially what you're teaching is kids programming, but, but it's, it's based on, on music and what they actually hear. So there's a bunch of different functions and things in there like so that it comes with quite a number of very cool samples built in. And then, so you, once you have your samples, you can start working on that. So if you start talking about programming and all you do is, well, a while true loop, and that's your conceptual model as to how you explain things, it gets super abstract. But if you're talking about, well, that was that one sample, and we want to hear it a lot, a lot of times, and we want it to loop, what do you do? Well, you start looping, and essentially, you're teaching people while true loops. So essentially what we're doing is looping the sample, then we sleep for the sample duration. Now we start working, can start working with variables. So you can specify the rate and then of the rate of at which things are actually played. And then you obviously you want to change your sleep, um, how, how long you sleep for as well. So here we go. So if you want to stick that in a variable, There we go. Good. Now, if you want to go super old school, you could do something like this, which is almost like in the run DMC type of space. So you can get some really interesting stuff. Now, it comes with some samples, like this one. What you see here is you're loading the samples, you define drums, which is essentially you're defining a function. Eight times do the drum kick. You define a function that does a snare. You define your synths, which do a whole bunch of chord progressions and notes. And then you start a bunch of threads and you loop stuff in there. And this is what it sounds like. That should be the bass. I don't know what's up with these speakers. Okay, if you have proper speakers, it sounds actually pretty cool. But anyway, this is Sonic Pi. Um, I find this interesting because I got into programming because I wanted to make music. And this looks like a perfect tool to combine Raspberry Pi, making music, and having fun, and getting kids into actually seeing programming and computers as a, as a creative output. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> um, next up is Jonathan Ensby. Um, while Jonathan's setting up, who here knows what a mod file is? Okay, so these are all the old people. <laughs> old nerds, yes. Um, yeah, I think a, a lot of us had um, collections of mod files on sticky disks before, um, n yes, Napster made kind of MP3s popular. Um, oh, Jonathan's going to be talking about a project he'd like some help with at the sprints, I think. If he can find these slides. Yay. Good.
Thank you. Uh, so, um, who knows what MathML is? That's awesome. Okay. Um, so, MathML is a markup language for equations and formula. Um, I am not a mathematician, not even close. I'm pretty much f close on failed maths. Uh, but um, I'm involved in a project called OnePlus, and essentially what it is is a math revision tool or platform or website or whatever you want to call it for high school kids in South Africa. So we have a CAPS, it's the syllabus that we are currently using in South Africa, aligned um, set of modules and questions, and it's multiple choice, and what we do is quite cool, is we give learners in currently previously disadvantaged environments or uh, communities um, access to the site, and they can do three questions a day, 15 questions a week. If they get 60% correct, at the end of the week, we give them airtime um, compliments of Mike. <laughs> Not compliments of him, we had to pay him still. Um, but we give them airtime, five rand airtime. Which is, a, we, when we first started designing this, we thought like five rand airtime is like, whatever. Like I wouldn't do anything for five rand. Um, but when we did some research up front, we discovered that a lot of these um, learners, like their, their actual budget for airtime that they spend in the week is five rand or less. So, um, it's a, it's a significant incentive. Um, the reason we're doing this is because uh, Investec, which is one of our partners, um, they have a program called, uh, one, uh, called ProMaths. And ProMaths is a kind of old school but very awesome program where they take proper, really awesome school teachers and go to schools on Saturdays and Sundays and in school holidays and offer ProMaths learners the ability to do revision um, before exams. And... Uh, Give me a second. And what's pretty amazing is that in South Africa, um, maths literacy is really bad. I have a whole presentation that I could go through, but it's going to just bore you. But the most important thing is that it starts off with a quote that um, I think 75% of the teachers that were polled in a particular study thought that um, if a fence rose from 60 centimeters to 75 centimeters high, that it was a 15% increase, uh, which is wrong in case you didn't know. Um, and these are school teachers, and of course that's pretty hectic for us to sort of absorb that most school teachers couldn't actually do the simple, simplest maths they're meant to be teaching. Um, we also know that a lot of school teachers are really just don't care, um, get the paycheck, attend the classes, and you know the students can fail, doesn't really matter. Um, however, obviously there are amazing teachers and that's great. What, what ProMaths does is take really good teachers and give these kids the opportunity to learn with really good teachers. And they take um, kids from lots of different schools and they uh, go to one school and they um, get taught. And the teachers that they are taught by are like truly amazing, inspirational people. Um, so the problem with, with ProMaths is that it requires teachers and it requires really good teachers and it can't scale obviously because you gotta pay them and also there aren't not actually enough of them out there to do this pro project. So, you know, to cover every single learner in South Africa. So what we came up with was a, a platform that lets us um, basically try and scale that with, with mobile. So using the internet and using the fact that we can hopefully inspire kids to do revision because we believe that revision is really important. So we came up with OnePlus. So OnePlus is really, really trivial. Um, the learners log in, they click on a button, and obviously this is designed for mobile, so it looks a bit funny on desktop. Um, and they get a question. Um, anyone want to hazard a guess? Now, obviously what's happening, uh, these, these learners are sitting at home. This is grade 11 maths, by the way. Um, the, they are sitting either at home or at school when they're doing this, and they're using papers and pen, and they, they're prop, you know, the whole the, the utopian idea of like, oh, they'll sit on the bus and do, uh, do maths homework is, is not real. They have to have papers and pens and things. And, it's pretty interesting. Um, so, any guesses? Tan cord. Uh, I'm going to go with tan cord theorem because he said it first. I don't know the answer. Incorrect. And. Angles in the same segment was the correct answer. Um, so neither of you are right. Um, 
uh, we also link to Siavula, which is a um, open source Creative Commons maths textbook written by a bunch of people, and um, obviously, well, not obviously, but is partly funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation. Um, so here we get an interesting question. Uh, that is, uh, A equals P one plus I to the power of N, and the N in this formula represents. Now the problem here is we can't represent that question in, um, I believe, in UTF-8, um, because the N, the, the power to N is impossible, or doesn't exist. It might, but it, let's pretend it doesn't. Um, or it could be a, like a, a fraction or something, or a, a, a something over something. Um, and so what we had to do in this case was, because these are, this is a feature phone product, so we have to run on like the crappiest Samsung really bad browser. Um, so we can't rely on JavaScript, and we have to use uh, pictures, basically. So um, that's a GIF, actually. That A equals P is a, is a GIF. And um, we do that manually at the moment. We have a, a math teacher who produces all the content and she gives us these files and we copy and paste pictures and dump them in the content. It's really, really bad and it's time consuming and it's really hard to scale up because obviously now that picture is set as a number of pixels, we can't make it bigger if we've got a bigger screen, etc. So why we did, went to the pictures thing is because when we started looking for a solution to do this with something like MathML, which the teacher can give us because she's she like produces textbooks, so she has a product that she does all her stuff in, and one of the outputs of it is MathML, is there wasn't a tool that did um, easy MathML to just straightforward GIF. Like, I want to pip install something. I don't want to go and like have seven different things chained together. It might be seven different things chained together, but I need one solution. So I don't have an answer, and that's kind of the point of this talk, is uh, if people, and this is like obviously like save the world kind of stuff, so you know this is real open source. Um, if somebody has, like, abilities in the space, or, or I'll come to you now, uh, or um, knows of a thing that we should be using, um, please come help. Otherwise, please come to the, the sprints on Saturday and Sunday and just help us put something together. Because all the parts are there. Like there's, we know that there's bits and pieces that do all these things, but putting it into something that's really simple is important. And that's my talk. I hope that wasn't too long. Does anyone know the answer? Correct. <laughs> cool. Um, I just want to say this is a, still a closed platform um, because we're still in beta. So if you go to oneplus.co.za, unfortunately, you can't sign up. Um, and we certainly aren't giving any of you airtime. Um, but uh, by all means, if, you if you're interested in just like keeping track of us or whatever, go to oneplus.co.za, um, click on the contact us, and just send us an email, and we'll add you to some list and spam you later. Cool. Thank you very much.